Good afternoon, I'm Chris Cooney, I'm President of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here to another edition of Good Day Metro South. Uh, after a busy Super Bowl weekend and a snowstorm that we haven't seen in the lights of the years, and Valentine's Day, I think I'm not the only one that looks a little tired here today, right? Uh, just, just the snowstorm, the kids' home is enough for me. But, uh, it, it's so nice to be here at Thorny Lee uh, Golf Club. I want to thank Rich Campbell, the general manager uh, of Thorny Lee, and Sharon Guthrie, as well as all of our servers and staff. Uh, please join me in a moment of silence in honor of all those in the community in need, in need of housing, in need of food, in need of health care, in need of mental health services. As well as, the, as well as those who are serving our nation and the armed forces throughout the world. Let's have a moment of silence for all. Thank you very much. As many of you know, the Chamber holds these programs regularly. It's a terrific opportunity to come together, reconnect. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces here. I see a lot of people uh, seeing each other for the first time uh, since the new year. So that's great. We have uh, we like to come together to learn uh, from interesting leaders in a variety of fields, and uh, today is no exception. Today we're very pleased to host, in collaboration with Catholic Charities, uh, Dr. Mark Melnick of the University of Massachusetts Studying Institute, and Brockton Mayor Robert Sullivan. Let's have a round of applause. For this. from them in a little bit. Uh, I would now like to point out the dots on each of your name badges. Uh -oh. Notice, uh, that is an invitation to meet at least one person, maybe more, with that same color dot throughout the room. Yeah, right. Part of the benefit of events like this is networking. And we want you to uh, strengthen the region and make your own network by meeting people you don't know. Because fine, you have something in common. Nine times out of ten. I would like to remind you also that there are green question and answer sheets in the center of each of your tables. Those question and answer sheets will be used by you if you're interested in asking a question about Dr. Melnick or the mayor. And uh, we will ask as many as we have if the time for it in the program. Uh, if you have one that's completed, uh, please raise it up we don't know what to ask you until chamber ambassador <laughs> or a staff member will grab it from you and bring it up forward. Uh, we have both Melville Cardozo from the chamber staff and uh, Emma uh, Fanardi who's also here with us. So just again, raise the question up in the air and grab that from you. It is now my pleasure to introduce our MC for today. Please join me in welcoming the past chair of the Chamber Board and president of Harbor One Bank, the only bank located and headquartered here in the city of Brockton. Yeah. Joe Kane. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, and on behalf of the whole Chamber Board, uh, welcome today. This is fantastic. Uh, sell out proud. I really do appreciate the Chamber's support. Um, and I also like to trust that you all had a very enjoyable Valentine's Day yesterday um, and took the opportunity to pro provide some essential love to a special someone in your life. And also thought process about understanding giving love on a daily basis. Especially today we're going to talk a lot about the elderly, concern. It, keep them in your house, please. The homeless, we need to keep those individuals less fortunate than us in our thoughts on a daily basis. So thank you all very much for your attendance today. I'd like to also thank, uh, we have a, a number of our ambassadors in attendance today. And I want to name you, if you could raise your hand and say hello. Uh, Brenda Karens, OCES. Thank you, Brenda. Julia Schneider, please good day. Catherine Light, Eastern Bank. Rico McNeil, Bluestone Bank. Virgin Manine, Combined Insurance. Alicia Sabuvida, Cape Verdean Association. Apologize, I did my best. Mark Bernard, Cape Verdean Association. 
Mary Ellen Baker, HR Alternatives. And Rick Cook, SCU. Excuse me a second. What's the release strategy with the report? I don't recall that. The release strategy for the report. Is it going to be public somewhere? Um, when we can. I don't see why not. I'm just, if, if I get a question, they're like, oh, that's in the report kind of thing. Like, I just don't. So we put that in the Okay, okay. Yeah, that sounds good. We have Mia Tran from Plymouth County District Attorney's Office. Beside her, we have Tim Cruz, our own Plymouth County District Attorney. Uh, Shirley Azak, Brockton City Council. <laughs> Honorable Robert Sullivan, City Mayor of Brockton. <laughs> Honorable Rita Mendez, Massachusetts State Rep. <laughs> Honorable Walter Timothy, Senator. <laughs> and uh, hometown favorite, Mike Brady, Senator. Today's Metro South program is being sponsored in part by OCES, Old Colony Elder Services, celebrating 50 years of care and collaboration, recognized as one of 2023's best places to work by Cape and Plymouth Business Media. OCS is a private nonprofit organization with locations in Brockton and Plymouth. OCS is designated as one of 23 aging services access points in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and proudly serves Plymouth County and surrounding communities. Through a talented experience and diverse workforce, OCS supports the independence and dignity of older adults and individuals with disabilities by providing essential information and services that promote healthy and safe living. The agency offers several programs to serve older adults, individuals with disabilities, their families, and caregivers. It's my pleasure to welcome our interviewer today, Doug Smith, Vice President for Advancement of Stonehill College. <laughs> now please join me in welcoming Alicia Delage, Chief Programs Officer from OCS. Alisa <laughs> Delage is the pro Chief Programs Officer at the OCS. She's been with OCES for nine years and oversees all consumer facing programs and their staff. Alisa has a master's degree in nonprofit leadership and a master's degree in social work, both from Boston University. She's a licensed independent clinical social worker in Massachusetts mm. and is passionate about supporting older adults as they age in place and transi traditionally transitioning them back to the community center. Alicia owns her own private practice where she conducts outpatient, outpatient behavioral health services, specializing in areas of aging, including caregiver support, hospice care, and grief work. Thank you both. And great luck. Thank you. Just borrowing the mic here. Welcome. It's so great to have you here today and to be with everyone. Uh, OCES is celebrating 50 years of care and compassion this year. Congratulations. Uh, Will OCES be doing anything special to celebrate this extraordinary milestone year? Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, yes, we will be, so I'm glad you asked that question. Um, so to celebrate our 50 years, I think one of the main things that we're looking to do is really uh, recognize some of the milestones that not only we have achieved as an agency, but also uh, look to agencies, business professionals in the community that we collaborate with who do similar work um, or who are willing to collaborate with us to meet our mission. 
Um, some of the milestones that OCES has reached in just the past 20 years, um, if we look back to 2008, we established our first supportive housing um, program in Brockton. Um, in 2011, we created the um, Greater Brockton Courting Task Force, which some of you may be familiar with, and that's still in existence today. Um, 2013, we established the first uh, awareness walk for elder abuse, um, and that's again an event that continues to happen today and has expanded to other areas in our catchment area. Um, and then 2015, we opened our office in Plymouth to expand kind of our, our network. Um, we cover Brockton, greater area, and also Plymouth and surrounding towns as well. Um, and just this past year, in 2023, we established our Behavior Health and Wellness Program, which includes the Elder Mental Health Outreach Team, and HOT for short, you'll hear me say that a couple times throughout this. Um, so, you know, as a part of kind of looking at our milestones and looking what else we need to accomplish, one of the things we're doing to celebrate our 50th is really this push with the community uh, to raise $50,000. Um, and a big piece of that will be to um, support that behavioral health program and behavioral health initiative uh, that, that we're looking to expand. Um, I can talk a little bit more later about some of the stats around that to show the need. Um, and then I think just in general, we're looking, at, as I said, to you know help uh, elevate some of the local businesses and professionals that also do the work that we do or collaborate with us. So we're uh, seeking nominations for awards um, for local business and professionals that we'll, we're really excited to honor um, as we celebrate our 50th. Uh, I hear that OCES recent, has recently been awarded a new contract that supports a few local housing authorities. Can you share this news with us today? Yeah, so this is really exciting. Um, we have a supporting housing program and we just recently got two new contracts to support uh, some more sites. So we'll be opening a site um, on Campello Building A and Kennedy Drive through the Brockton Housing Authority um, and also one that will support the Whitman and West Bridgewater Brockton Housing Authorities. Uh, what's so great about the supportive housing programs is that it's a free service to the residents. It allows them the space to uh, have access to additional services and you know members of OCS. And we can also offer free educational um, services to the members who live there as well. Thank you. And for the final question, can you share how businesses and community leaders are best able to support OCES? Sure. Yeah, so kind of a call to action, right? I had mentioned our push to raise $50,000 to support our 50th anniversary. So uh, we ask that local businesses and um, professionals kind of help contribute to that effort. Uh, and it will be helped support our MHOP program, as I talked about. Um, right now, our MHOP program is servicing Brockton, Greater Brockton. Um, and we have about 130 referrals and have been able to work with about 70 individuals. Um, and we have 25 people on our wait list. So there's a high need for, for this within the community. And we're excited to raise additional funds to expand that program. Lisa, as a small token of our appreciation, I'd like to present you with our chamber pen Thank in a pouch. Thank and it's your birthday today. Woo! <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you for being with us. Enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you, Doug and Elise. Now I'd like to introduce our partner. Wait a minute. Make sure you get my good side. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce our partner for this great uh, Good Day uh, Mental Health Program, Catholic Charities. Boston is the most comprehensive nonprofit social service provider in Massachusetts, serving thousands of people regardless of faith or background each year through their four core service areas. Catholic Charities has proudly served the Brockton community for over 100 years and continues to address the most urgent issues facing communities across Eastern Massachusetts. Poverty, hunger, homelessness, as well as access to affordable childcare, education, and legal advocacy. Strengthening families and empowering people to lead more stable lives. Please join me in welcoming newly appointed president and CEO of Catholic Charities, Kelly Tucker.
Thank you very much for having us here today. Um, we're really pleased to be a part of this. Someone just said, we don't see you here too much. Well, now we're here and we look forward to coming back. So thank you for including us. Um, I'd like to thank the mayor for his partnership. Um, we have been talking for a while and had to be more collaborative, so I appreciate that. We're here today because um, thanks to the support of the Yaki Foundation, we launched a study about a year ago to try to look at the needs of the Brockton community. You know, we all recognize that these needs um, are really acute right now. And the question is how best to respond. And so we engaged UMass Donahue Institute to gather the information we need to help start making a plan for how we best serve this community for the future. We have been serving the City of Champions for more than a century, and the important thing is that we continue to evolve to meet the needs today. Um, we do have food through our pantry. We have provide emergency living assistance to keep families in their homes. We're trying to prevent homelessness. We are educating our community through our ESOL and nursing assistant and home health aid programs. And we also have really great summer overnight stays for local kids at our Sunset Point Camp in Hall each year, which is very special. <laughs> I announced today that we did just receive funding from the Flatley Foundation to make sure we can continue to have happy kids every summer in Hall from the Brockton area. So very excited. you have fun to do so. So Brockton is one of 23 program locations the Catholic Charities of Greater Boston runs. All these sites help thousands of individuals and it's important to emphasize of all faiths, all backgrounds. We do what we do because our Catholic faith informs that. That's our why, but we don't ask anybody what religion they are, where they came from, how they came to meet us. We just say, how can we help? I want everyone to really understand that. We serve in four core service areas. It's basic needs, that's our shelters, our food pantries, adult education, workforce development, family and youth services, as well as refugee and immigrant services. We are a comprehensive service agency. What we really try to do in all the areas that we work in throughout the region is listen to our communities and be really as responsive to the needs of those folks living there. The stories, I can tell you, particularly lately, have been heartbreaking. We have families who today are choosing between paying for food or paying the rent. Single moms working two and three jobs that are still struggling to make ends meet. It's a tough time out there, and I know you all know that. Food insecurity, we heard so much about that during the pandemic, and I think many people thought, oh, that, that's over. We did not see that problem get better after the pandemic supposedly ended. I know many people are still dealing with COVID, but we're not at that acute status right now. But at our pantries, what we're seeing today is that the number of families we used to see in an entire week, that's what we're seeing on any given day. The problem is not getting better, folks. It's much worse than it was before. When we were here, the mayor was with us um, giving out turkeys this Thanksgiving. A gentleman came up to me and he said, thank you for this service you provide to the community. I never thought I would find myself trying to get help at Thanksgiving, but I worked at Brockton Hospital for more than two decades, and I've been laid off, and I need your help. And it was really heartbreaking. Um, so any image we have of who needs services right now, it's changing, and it's evolving, and it's working people. It's not just folks who don't currently have a job. Um, it's what makes us all very passionate about our work at Catholic Charities. Hope and compassion are core values. We have 425 employees who care deeply about people in our communities and serving them and walking beside them on a journey. We hope from the crisis to self-sufficiency. Um, we are addressing these overlapping emergencies, inflation, post-pandemic job loss, illnesses people are facing, and, and the plague that is food insecurity. A client saying, I finally feel hopeful is our goal here. After they reach out, we want to be there for them. We know gateway cities like Brockton are in need of these partnerships. So we stand together as your nonprofit partners with the business community, with those working in government, to stand together to find these solutions. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mark Melnick at UMass Institute, UMass Donahue Institute, who has tried to give the information I think we all need to better frame this conversation and figure out how best to work together. So thank you for your attention and your partnership going forward. We're thrilled and honored to be a part of this community.
<laughs> uh, time we got afternoon, folks. Um, so Kelly, first, thank you for the introduction and thanks for the support from Catholic Charities on this work that we just recently uh, did with you all. Um, I've. It's interesting because uh, the mayor and I actually were here almost exactly a year ago. And when, right when I came in, I was like, "Oh yeah, the roses and all that." So it was uh, <laughs> kind of kind of how quickly life goes by. And a funny story about having been here a year ago is uh, when I spoke here last year. I spoke about the state of the economy, uh, and I do this roadshow economy. And uh, one of the things was I was uh, mayor went first, and I uh, <clears throat> was uh, checking the time, and I put my phone in my pocket and accidentally bumped my uh, podcast on, right? So I'm standing here and I'm giving this talk and I talk for like 25 minutes or something. And the whole time I'm talking, I hear like in my pocket, right? And I'm like, who is the jerk who is listening to the radio while I'm talking, right? And so then I get done talking and I go and sit down. I'm like, oh. It was me. So, uh, and luckily I went and I looked at the YouTube thing and you couldn't hear it at all. So I was the only one who was affected by it. So if you thought I gave a good talk last year, if you were here, just know that it was done like on a high wire because I was uh, uh, doing, I had my phone distracting me at the same time. So um, for folks who are unfamiliar, the UMass Donahue Institute, we're a, a public service and economic development arm of the UMass system. And uh, we do a lot of different things at the Institute. We have 170 employees across 10 business units. But I usually, when I talk about the Institute, I talk about it in two main verticals. We uh, uh, have a handful of our business units that are specifically in the role of social service and they're uh, servicing different kinds of contracts uh, that are helping different folks in the community. So we do some things in Head Start. Uh, and we also run the Career Center down here in Brockton. Uh, the other part of the Donahue Institute that we're known for does uh, different kinds of consulting research for folks, mainly in Massachusetts, uh, although uh, anything partly just because of the brand UMass, uh, though we can do work anywhere. Uh, so it was interesting how this project in particular kind of takes the two different elements, the Donahue Institute, and brings them together uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of a full circle sort of way. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, Joe and Kelly both uh, uh, put it really nicely when you think about uh, some of the challenges uh, that this this study kind of un, uh, underscores. You know, during the pandemic, there was a lot of uh, attention on vulnerability and what uh, shutting down an economy meant for folks who were on the fringes of an economy, especially an economy that was performing pretty well. Massachusetts economy pre-pandemic was doing great. Uh, we had very low unemployment rate, high wages in the aggregate. Uh, and then when you slow things, when you stop things, you're like, whoa, you know, we knew that there was inequality. We knew that renters were more vulnerable. We knew that the experiences in a strong economy looked different from different parts of the state, different racial groups and so on. Um, <clears throat> but it was made much more acute during the pandemic. It's really interesting that when the pandemic is over, you know, and we still continue to see these kinds of issues, but we probably don't talk about them quite as much as we should, right? And especially in a state where the unemployment rate is 3%, in a state that has the highest per capita income, and which makes us the richest state in the country. And then knowing that those experiences and those different, uh, within our state and within different parts of the state um, can be felt quite differently, especially when you take into account something like inflation. Food insecurity and the, uh, those issues of food insecurity are, are, may, are acute because of just the amount uh, the cost of what it takes to fill up your basket of goods for your family. And if that go, if, if um, money is finite, and when that money gets stretched further, what do those issues look like? So this project here was, a, was an excellent one for us to engage in, and Catholic Charities was a great partner with us. They'll, they're gonna make the report available on their website. But it was, in, it was a work intended specifically for Catholic Charities and a couple of uh, core ways I talked about us. All right, all right. And, uh, uh, and it was, uh, and it was uh, intended to highlight a couple of core things for Catholic Charities. First and foremost was, uh, and I think the best way to think about it is it was a, a social and community needs assessment, right? So we were taking different types of information about the community, both in terms of aggregate data on Brockton and Greater Brockton, and what some of the characteristics of the community look like. Uh, but then we also wanted to understand, separate from secondary data, which tells us one story about a community, but talking to key informants, people who know the community well, and understand, okay, well, what are the issues out there? Especially because data sometimes lag, and because 
some issues are not covered very well in secondary data and wanting to understand, okay, well, what else is happening out there? And, and both through key informant interviews and through focus groups with social service leaders, it allowed us to uncover what are some of the major issues facing the community overall. And we de uh, developed a final report that we shared with Catholic Charities that, that does this overview of what are the needs of the community, the makeup of the community, uh, what are the uh, social service organizations that are out there that are trying to help support Brockton and, and in particular areas, uh, where are their potential gaps, and where are the ways in which Catholic Charities and others can plug in more to, be, uh, to help those who are most in need uh, in, in the Brockton area. And so that's everything that you see there. So uh, through our research, which is a combination, again, of secondary data, leaning on things like the census, uh, but also uh, other administrative data, but then also um, through these interviews uh, that we did in focus groups, we identified six core areas of need uh, within the uh, Brockton, right? So first, child care and youth services, job training, housing, immigrant services, mental and behavioral health, and food insecurity and basic assistance. Um, these were the things that stood out both uh, from our data analysis and the different parts of um, talking with people about where we, we folks see the challenges. And I'll touch on each of these elements a bit. So first, taking a look at Brockton at a glance, um, this is some of the secondary data that, that kind of, you know, highlights a lot of those kind of broad gateway city issues. Uh, and gateway cities in Massachusetts, by their very definition, are areas that are regional urban centers, but also have significant demographic and economic challenges, right? And so when we look at Brockton compared to Massachusetts, some of those things stand out. And this is common for most of the gateway cities in Massachusetts. There are 26 of them, but Brockton is probably a quintessential version of a gateway city. Uh, unemployment rate in Brockton currently sits at 4.7%. It's pretty good. We t historically think of full employment as something being 5% or below. Uh, but we've, uh, in Massachusetts, we have much lower unemployment rates in different parts of the state. In the state right now, we have a 3.2% unemployment rate, and we've been under 3% for much of the year. So Brockton does look quite different than the rest of Massachusetts. The other thing that's really critically important about Ma uh, Brockton's population is the importance of the immigrant community within, uh, within the city. Kelly mentioned uh, the ESOL services that Catholic Charities provides, and it's a, uh, it's a significant area of need for this region and for the state, and most likely going forward. When I talk about the broader state economy in Massachusetts, I'll, I'll always say that the economic story in Massachusetts is an immigrant story. Since 1990, 80% of the labor force growth in Massachusetts has been because of foreign-born labor. Uh, and as we uh, really stand on the precipice of labor shortages in Massachusetts with an aging workforce, that's only going to become more the issue. We're going to need immigrants to backfill job vacancies across the entire economy. And Brockton really truly serves as a gateway city because it's a place with a ton of immigrants. And here we see 30, a third of the city is foreign born compared to just 18% for the state, Massachusetts has the high, seventh highest immigrant population in the nation, by the way. So that 18% looks small sitting underneath this 32, but this is big by national standards. So that really stands out how important the immigrant community is here. Um, so a poverty, uh, the poverty rate in Massachusetts is 10%. This is actually pretty low by national standards. In Brockton, it's 15.3%. Uh, you guys hear me okay, right? Yeah, I like to move around. So. Uh, I'll be, okay. Uh, so, um, but poverty is a terrible measure of, of uh, relative deprivation in the economy. Uh, the poverty line is the same throughout the nation, no matter the cost of living within a community, right? So when you see a poverty, num poverty rate number, this isn't necessarily the experience felt on the ground. The poverty line in Northeast Ohio is, for a family of four, is $24,000. In uh, Greater Boston, it's $24,000. And the experiences are very, very different in terms of what the costs are for people, especially when we think about housing, which I'll touch on a little bit, little bit. I mentioned Northeast Ohio because I'm from there originally, and one of my favorite stories about this is that when I bought my house in Natick, Kyrie Irving sold his house in Cleveland for the same amount of money. Um, and uh, and uh, very, very different houses. So. Uh, Massachusetts has the most well-educated population in the nation. 47% of our state has a college degree. 
Brockton uh, is at uh, half, uh, about half that at 25%. So these are some of the challenges that we see. So <clears throat> let me get into the six main areas. First is about child care and youth services. Uh, so what are some of the core things here? Right now in, Ma in Brockton, about 11,500 children uh, are in households receiving federal basic assistance. So we're, when we say that, uh, these are folks who are on food stamps or other types of federal assistance, and we were using that as a very crude way of defining need, okay? 30% of those kids are six or under. So that's about 3,400 kids, okay? So what we're looking at here are the number of certified child care seats that are available for kids in the community. For children under six, there are 1,300 available seats and another 700 kids on waiting lists. So if we were to assume that all of those kids who are receiving federal assistance, who are under the age of six, who are not uh, full, you know, uh, into the elementary school system yet, you know, the five-year-olds will be kind of on the line, but um, that there's a lot of need out there in the community for, for different forms of childcare uh, for kids. This is also a challenge, though, for older children as well. Um, you know, for the under 18 population, uh, we, there's um, available seats for about 11% of kids. Now, for that population, of course, you know, they're a little bit older, they can watch themselves and stuff. But, you know, thinking about those kind of in the, those tweener kids, right, you know, after school programs and those kinds of things, those are missing too. Brockton uh, lags several communities in the, in the area around this. Um, and as, as, I note, as we note here in the graphic, uh, there are seats available for about 11% of all kids six and under. Uh, Boys and Girls Club and Old Colony YMCA, and I met some of the folks from Old Colony YMCA earlier, are some of the largest providers of school services. And then uh, obviously the, the summer camp program was mentioned. But this is an area of, of significant need, and we know this is a big challenge for families uh, in general. I would, you know, I'm a sociologist by training, I do this work all the time. Um, but it's amazing when you're living it and you experience it. But the last year, my kids before they, uh, the the one full year of my kids in in, pre, in uh, paid programs before my older one went into school, my wife and I spent thirty thousand dollars on them being in uh, preschool and daycare. Right, and it really hit home for me where I was like, man. So if somebody's if a two parent household and somebody's making forty thousand dollars a year, it's like why are they working? Right, you know, and so. Uh, and, and they weren't going to fancy places. One was a, a at-home daycare, the other was just like a regular old preschool. But, uh, but, but you, you'll see what those experiences are, especially for low and moderate income folks. All right, for job training, uh, these numbers are a little bit different than each other because um, the report was finished before uh, the slides that just have the brand newest uh, unemployment rate. But Brockton's unemployment rate is traditionally above that of the state. Um, but the labor force participation rate in the city is actually pretty high. 85% of working age adults, which we're defining as 18 to 64, are, um, uh, are in the labor force compared to 80% for the state. Now, Brockton's a bit, uh, and so that's not atypical for cities that have uh, elevated unemployment rates, because um, you have a lot of people hustling, trying to find work, um, but we see this elevated unemployment rate. What we try to highlight in this uh, is, um, the need for different kinds of job training services, and then recognition of wraparound services. We have a great quote from my friend John Murray who directs the Mass Hire uh, Greater Brockton, He's a, and that's the part of the Donahue Institute that's also in the city. But in John's quote, highlighting in here that, <coughs> for, uh, that sometimes for families, finding a job comes like fourth or fifth in the line when you're thinking about <coughs> whether it's domestic abuse issues that may be at home, uh, uh, mental health issues, things going on with your kids, food insecurity, what have you. So a traditional nine to five opportunity may actually create other headaches in your life. And I'll touch on this as we get into food security a little bit more, especially when food pantries even are open. Uh, they're traditionally open during hours that are working hours. Um, so yeah, so job training being uh, really critical. We, and we did a really, um, Fun project a couple of months back with uh, um, with Mass Hire and uh, Sheila and Jason on uh, focused in particular on the construction industry in the region and some of the opportunities that are there. Um, but yeah, so so but the the importance of the of being able to find training opportunities for folks, especially um, in this in uh, an economy that is shifting uh, to a lot of knowledge based kinds of work. There's great opportunity potential there as well because. Um, 
whether it's construction or other things, simply because the labor force is kind of getting smaller in Massachusetts. So our ability to uh, leverage the available labor supply and increase labor force participation and employability for folks uh, is not only a, a social justice thing, but it's just a pure economics thing. Uh, so the uh, opportunities around job training are, are essen uh, essential in our gateway cities. Housing, these, you know, it's rare that I'm stunned by numbers um, because I do this all the time, but this one uh, I found pretty jarring. So <coughs> orienting you to this graphic here, the, re the red bar is housing cost burden for owners in Massachusetts, and the orange is housing cost burden for owners in Brockton, and the same for renters. What's housing cost burden? Housing cost burden is when you're spending 30% or more of your income on housing. Massachusetts has some of the highest housing cost burdens in the nation uh, when you compare across states, despite the fact that we have some of the highest wages, right? Um, but when you look at a place like Brockton, the, the problem jumps off the page. A third of owners in the city are housing cost burdened. And nearly 65% of renters are housing cost burdened, right? So this is <clears throat> a, a, a huge challenge. This is why we talk a lot in, uh, at the state level about the housing crisis in Massachusetts, because when we see these kinds of numbers, right, um, the housing cost burden for renters has, is um, something that's so tied to the economy, right? So we see that number go up during recessions, right? But the problem with that is that it keeps going up. Like for owners, like the nice thing is that like, you know, you own a home, your home is frozen in the time that you bought it, right? And so <clears throat> when the economy is bad, <clears throat> okay, you're, you're more uh, uh, stressed about your finances, but when the economy is good, you, the price has stayed the same and maybe your wages have gone up, that doesn't happen with rent. And what happens with rents, uh, it, with renters are folks who are, tend to be in much more uh, um, precarious situations with their finances. Um, the, the city itself has about 4,500 federally subsidized housing units. Um, and the interviewees we talked to reported there were a notable number of families who needed to leave the city to find more affordable housing. I, I find this uh, interesting and somewhat ironic uh, because Brockton is more affordable than a lot of places in the eastern part of Massachusetts. But I love pointing out to people, and have had it pointed out to me before when I think about this issue, is that there are two parts of affordability. There's what a house costs, and there's how much money you make, right? So housing could be more affordable, but if you're not making a lot of money, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, so this ties back to the job training thing as well. Uh, homelessness uh, was another piece that we had uh, looked at inside this work. Um, Father Bills in uh, Mainspring is the main homeless shelter provider in uh, Brockton. I saw some of those folks around today. Uh, and uh, in our research, by all accounts, we're doing a commendable job dealing with the issues. Um, there's some um, challenges with measuring homelessness down at the municipal level. Uh, we looked at some data from what was called a continuum of care that includes Brockton and rest of Plymouth County. Um, there was enough shelter, we, and we estimate about a, a thousand homeless folks on any given night within that continuum of care. There's enough shelter to house 100% of families, and there's um, <clears throat> obviously that's a part of the uh, statewide policy about um, the right to housing, uh, especially for families. Um, but only enough shelter for about 66% of individuals. Um, I think importantly here, this ties in a lot to uh, some of the issues we're also seeing with the migrant crisis uh, and the availability of housing for folks as well. So we anticipate this being more of an issue in the future. Immigrant services, I already touched on this very briefly, but one in three folks in um, Brockton are foreign born. 19% speak English less than very well. It's a very awkward way to phrase it, but this is the way the Census Bureau measures this, where they, people self-report their English-speaking abilities. Um, what's interesting is in most parts of Massachusetts, the, the main language spoken is, uh, other than English, is Spanish. Uh, but in Brockton, we have very large Haitian and Cape Verdean populations. So, the, uh, so we have a lot of folks who are speaking, as the Census Bureau will refer to them as Indo-European languages. Um, 
And, uh, but though it seems that there's been qualitatively more folks from Spanish-speaking countries recently, especially from uh, Ecuador, a few groups who have been, uh, uh, and a lot of the services tend to come from cultural organizations, so some that we call out here, the Haitian Community Partners, Latin Women's Association, and Cape Verdean Women United. Um, there's about 580 certified ESOL seats in Brockton, but more than 1,000 folks on the waiting list. And the lack of ESOL can lead to significant issues in underemployment. In different parts of my career, we, I've done work looking at the um, <clears throat> wage differences for immigrants. And uh, the most predictive part of wage differences for immigrants to native born is English speaking ability once you control for educational attainment. Uh, and Catholic Charities, again, is a large provider of ESOL uh, in, the, in the city, but there's still uh, need for more. Mental health and behavioral issues. This is a little slipper, more slippery to uh, measure, uh, but we were able to approximate based on some uh, national data in demographics that about one in four Brockton residents would benefit from mental health services based on national rates. Um, some of the largest mental health providers in the Brockton area um, the Brockton Area Multi-Services Incorporate and Brockton uh, Neighborhood Health Center. Uh, more specialized organizations such as Family and Community Resources focus on issues around domestic abuse. Uh, and then obviously bilingual services would be really important in the community given the characteristics of the population. And then food insecurity. Uh, in 2023, food prices were up 10% and fuel and utility prices up 35% from 20, uh, 2022. When I would do the roadshow on the economy, I would show the breakout of what happened with inflation and the, and the fuel price increases in Massachusetts is really what drove inflation. We had the benefit of already having high housing costs, I guess. So that was less of an issue than say like some of the changes that happened in the US. But it was the fuel stuff that really uh, uh, taxed households. Um, by our estimation, about 40,000 people in Brockton are facing food insecurity. Um, and an estimated one in four Brockton households have to choose between buying food and affording other basic needs, and Kelly already touched on some of this. A lot of the major uh, uh, food pantries and basic assistance include Catholic Charities, Salvation Army, and My, and My Brother's Keeper. And here, um, uh, Greater Boston Food Bank partners with some of the food pantries to distribute over 1.9 million meals in the area. Um, but we, we found that there was a lack of coordination uh, across food banks, which um, one uh, was an issue with when things were open, but also maybe some of the, the ways in which um, uh, economies of scale can be achieved in buying uh, and food purchasing. So the map on the right just shows the location of where some of the food pantries are. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to underscore in that is thinking about availability, especially for folks without mobility, without a car. Um, but one of the things, and this is awful to look at in this room, but I, I'll, I'll drive you th through it real quick, is that we wanted to look at the availability of or when food pantries were open uh, in the community. And I think what was really important to highlight, so the pink means they're, the green means they're open, the pink means they're closed, and the cross hatches uh, by appointment. And I think the thing that is probably most important that we wanted to highlight for folks is look at Saturday and Sunday. It's super pink, right? There's very little availability uh, in it, when it comes to weekends, and there's very little availability when it comes to evenings. Uh, and so this, you know, kind of ties back to the nine to five comment I made before around uh, the job hunt and like, you, how are you able to get access to uh, services that you might need? Okay, in terms of recommendations, we focused on a few main things. Uh, and, and what some of the pieces might be particularly for a Catholic Charities who's a major uh, nonprofit uh, who can help kind of fill the gaps in some of the things we're seeing. Some of that ties to um, you know, the communications-based networks and, and, uh, and kind of having some sort of management uh, of coordination across different agencies. There's a lot of organizations doing really important and good work, but there are places where maybe, uh, again, there's economies of scales that, that could be recognized or, or optimized through better coordination. Uh, and we see a place where Catholic Charities can be central in that um, and, and can help to work overcome some of the funding hurdles. 
Uh, other challenges that exist that we highlighted to, um, the mayor may be happy to hear us say this, but I've, is a two-year election cycle is a huge challenge when you think about leadership within a, within a community uh, There's a that leads to a lot of a higher level of turnover. Uh, and there's always high turnover in the social services to begin with. Um, so uh, with that, I think I'll stop. I maybe ran a little bit over, uh, but I know the big star's after me, so. <laughs> I think Kelly and Mark, uh, it's very compelling uh, information that we should all take note of and make sure that we're, again, doing all we can to be involved in helping our nonprofits um, continue to service our community. Youngstown. I went to BC and a bunch of people raised for Ohio guys. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there was a bunch of BC guys who used to go to my Boston Browns backers with me. Honor like and privilege 2000, 2000, to introduce that time. the mayor of Brockton, uh, Mayor Robert Sullivan. It's you, Bill. A man that needs no introduction. You might want to take a seat, man. Well, I, 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 got this, I got this long speech. <laughs> <laughs> mayor Robert Sullivan was born and raised in Brockton. He's the son of Robert and Susan Sullivan, grew up on Wellington Street in War II. He attended Brockton Public Schools. Graduated from Brockton High School in 1988. We're going to calculate your year. We're going to know how old you are. He earned his BA and MBA at Boston College and his JD at the New England School of Law. Prior to being elected mayor for a third term now, congratulations, mayor, he served on the Brockton City Council. In that role, he was elected by his colleagues to serve as the City Council president five times. He previously served as a volunteer board member of the Good Samaritan Medical Center the St. Joseph Manor Nursing Home and the Brockton Historical Society. He's a volunteer youth soccer, basketball, and baseball coach within the city of Brockton. He is a member of the Old Our Lady of Lord's Church. He's married to Maria Luizzi Sullivan, who is also grew up in Brockton, and they have three children. Please welcome Mayor Sullivan. Hey, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so excited to be here. I want to thank Chris Cooney and the team at the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. Uh, if you are a member of the chamber, kindly raise your hand. Thank you very much. If you're not, please join. Please join. <laughs> so I'm Bob Sullivan. Uh, it really is an honor and privilege to be here today. I want to thank Dr. Mark for his in-depth analysis. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, if you are a uh, business owner or a, an employee here in the city of Brockton or someone that's invested in the city of Chippewa, would you again please raise your hand? Those that didn't raise your hand, I'm going to tell you right now, we're open for business. So <laughs> kindly relocate. Um, so a couple different things. I want to thank my chief of staff, Sidney Merrill. Uh, I haven't done a PowerPoint since uh, MBA school, so let me see here. <laughs> <laughs> other way, other way. Hey, <laughs> um, So again, I want to thank City Metal, my chief of staff. I also have my team here, Suzanne McCormick from my office. Um, Social Service Director Jasmine Bradshear is in the back, and City of Canada, Government Affairs, uh, Public Policy, Rob Mayer, City Planner is here. Um, but I also want to uh, just also thank all the organizations, the nonprofits, all of us in this room, we share something in common. We're in the people business. It doesn't matter if you're a banker, a lawyer, a mayor, a nonprofit, a developer. We're in the people business every day, right? We have to help people. And coming out of the pandemic, people need help. And so we have to provide the services. So what Dr. Mark just shared is, is really uh, eye-opening, but it's also something that uh, we need to vet through the data and the metrics. I also want to thank the uh, BOND, which is a uh, Brockton Area Hunger Network. We have uh, intake partners. I'm going to read them. Uh, the Charity Guild, Boys and Girls Club, Catholic Charity, Salvation Army, Massasoit Community College, BPS, which is Brockton Public Schools, and uh, Full Gospel Church. are always working together for food and security. So a week ago today, I wasn't in Brockton, Mass. I, uh, I got up at 3 in the morning, drove to Logan at 4 a.m. I jumped on a plane and went to Manhattan with Troy Clarks and the CFO. We were invited to go down and speak to the uh, Bond Buyers National Conference right across from Central Park, this ritzy place. This kid from Brockton walked in. I was just you know, awestruck. And people might say, well, why were you there? We were only there for a day. I'll tell you why. People wanted to hear Brockton's story. 
what Brockton, Massachusetts means. And you can pick any city in the United States of America, but they chose us because we've been creative here in Brockton. I said this before, we refinanced our debt liability. So we have a pension obligation bond. So when I became mayor, kind of a numbers guy, I was looking at uh, where we were in terms of our, our pension liability, how we're gonna make sure we have the funds for our retirees, comparing and contrasting to other municipalities in the city, I mean in the Commonwealth and beyond. Uh, and the interest rates at that time were 2%. So I said to Mr. Clarkson, let's consider refinancing, like refinancing your home, right? And so we did, we went out to the market and I told this story. Uh, it was supposed to be a two day sale in, in Wall Street. It was closed uh, four and a half hours into the first day. It was 300 million, we had 1.3 billion. So this is considered an example now, national model, Brockton Mass. So they invited us down and I wanna just tell you right now how it was an honor and privilege to be there as the mayor because a lot of people have Brockton on their radar. And I'm talking about people from LA, Henry Cisneros, who served uh, under, under President Clinton. He was the mayor of San Antonio back in the day. He knew about Brockton. And it wasn't about Rocky and Marvin. It was because we're being creative here in the city of champions. So again, uh, the slogan is championing the future. So we have American Rescue Act, right? The, the federal money that's coming down. And we got a tranche of it. We got 34 million directly. Uh, Congressman Lynch came down. We have a wonderful federal delegation. You know, Congressman Lynch, I say this, he grew up in Southie, but he could have grew up in War II or War III or War I or seven or six or five or four. The guy gets it. And so 34 million direct to the city of Brockton. And then Plymouth County got 110 million of their tranche. Brockton's the only city in Plymouth County. So out of that, we're gonna get another 17 and a half. Uh, and then I'm also advocating to get additional money because I don't think they'll spend it uh, by the time of the drop dead date. But a lot of mayors took the money and decided to hire people or do some stop gaps. I didn't do that. What I said is I want to get the biggest bang for the buck. I want it to be legacy. I want to invest in what the next generation is going to need. But also the generation that came before us. What our seniors need. What our veterans need. And ultimately what our boys and girls need here in the city of Brockton. So the Mary Cruz Kennedy Senior Center, which we know is downtown, right, is named after the mom of the late, uh, great uh, state senator and state rep, Tommy Kennedy. Uh, it's right next to St. Pat's, right across, Liz Charlie, right across from Hawaii. Uh, and so we're investing almost uh, 7 .6, over 7.6 million. Now what's awesome about this, it's helping our seniors, but it's adding 5,000 square feet, and we're not taking away any parking spaces at all. So this is gonna be state-of-the-art senior center in the city of Brockton but it's in the core of the city of Brockton. That speaks volumes. We would not have been able to do that without the efforts of the federal delegation. The next, uh, the next location is a War Memorial on West Elm Street. All of us know about it, we drive by it a million times, but back in the day when it was created for the, for the men uh, and women that came back, the greatest generation, they had a bowling alley in there, and it was used on a, on a social component. It really kind of came into disrepair over the years, and myself, and I want to thank uh, Councilor Shirley Azak for being here, you know, when the elevator was broken at City Hall, we had to use the War Memorial as our city council. And you know what, in the summer it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal, there was no air conditioning. It wasn't built with air conditioning. So we, uh, we have spent 4.9 million, again, of federal money to make sure we can repurpose this. And the ribbon cutting is in two months. And so we're gonna be able to utilize this as the venue that it was built for, to honor those that paid the ultimate sacrifice but also to invite new people in to learn about what it means to serve our great nation. So again, 4.9 million, that's a generational project. In terms of the progress we're doing, and this is my favorite one, I'm a little biased because back in the day, and Joe said I graduated in 88, so yeah, I'm 53 and I didn't have gray hair back then. Back in the day, I used to lifeguard. There's two summers at the Cosgrove Pool. It's on the east side, it's right off of Crescent Street. Uh, it's near the Eastside Fire Station. It abuts the Joe Pluff Elementary School. It also abuts the Salisbury Park. And what's so special about this is uh, every April I go down and, and meet the federal delegation. I meet with Senator Warren and Senator Markey and Congressman Lynch. And what I do is, I quite honestly, those that remember Jerry McGuire, I say, show me the money. Show me the money, we need the money. We're a gateway community, 106,000. I'm the biggest cheerleader of the city of Brockton, but it's also working with the state delegation, the city council, the school committee. We have to make sure that Brockton gets its fair share, right? And so, to the credit of uh, Congressman Lynch and Senator Markey, uh, I asked them point blank. I said, where'd you learn how to swim? They said, the municipal pool. I said, this is a municipal pool, right? But we need money. 
And they said, well, how much do you need? And I said, well, how much do you have? <laughs> they said, well, we have, a, we have about two million in President Biden's office. So I said, great, thank you, Ed. Thanks, Steve, I need three. And, uh, and you know what? They came up with $3 million. So the three million is from the omnibus. That's, they can't use the word earmark anymore, right? But it is an earmark, three million bucks. And then another three million from ARPA. And this is the beach for many people that can't go over the bridge to Cape Cod or can't go to Nantasket. But what we have done is we've actually destroyed it. If you go there right now, right, the cranes and the bulldozers, it's gone. The pool is gone, right? But it's going to be an unbelievable pool. It's a splash park for kids, a shade area, a picnic <coughs> area. The pool itself is configured like the pool, the old state pool at Brockton High. This is a game changer. And, you know, I'm really excited that the federal delegation, it's historic because they, all, all three of them came to meet with us last year at City Hall. And then we jumped in a bat bus, and as the mayor, I chaired the bat bus corporation, and I took them over to the cause grove. And many, if not all, the elected officials joined me. And so that's what that picture is. It, it shows collaboration with our federal delegation. Right? The money comes from the feds from Washington, goes to Beacon Hill to our state, and then ultimately to City Hall, 45 School Street. But this is something I'm extremely proud of as, as a kid that, that swam there and life got it there. And ultimately, this is something that everybody in the city of Brockton should be proud of. All right, if you've driven by City Hall, you see the scaffolding going up. City Hall, in my humble opinion, is the most beautiful city hall in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. If you haven't, come in, please visit us. Doors open, come on in. If you wanna walk and talk about City of Brockton, I'll start there. The artwork in there uh, really uh, is top-notch artwork. I mean, you could go to the museum in Boston, but come to 45 School Street, you're gonna see better artwork. This is phenomenal, but it's leaking. Right? It's, it's slate that was put on the roof in the late 1800s. So th through the efforts, collaboration efforts of, uh, of Rob and his team and, and our ARPA folks that are working with us, we actually found the slate mill in Vermont where the original slate was manufactured when it was built. Now they don't have the actual same color anymore, but it's a pretty, pretty close match. So we are repurposing it. Uh, we're starting uh, from the top and going way to the down, to the bottom. But we're also cognizant of the fact that we have visitors that come each and every day to City Hall. So what I needed to do was to try to figure out how we can make sure we're in the people business, customer service business. So right next door to City Hall, if you're familiar, is Brockton Commons, right? Which is, it was typically, when it was first built, it was for our seniors, right? But it's a building right next door, high-rise residential property. First floor is commercial. And I walked by one day going to my car and I noticed Bill Kelly. Is Billy here? No, he never misses. But I'm going to give him a shout out to tell him I mentioned him. Yeah. Bill Callahan had a, a full rent sign. And so I said, let's look into that. And so we did an RFP and we rented it. And so now it's only 30, 30 yards from door to door. So we're going to have a Brockton City Hall annex there, right? So that when people need to go to the third floor, they can't. They can go to the annex. We're going to have runners going back and forth. Again, it's trying to be creative, but it's also thinking outside the box. $98 million, and again, we bonded this in, in its totality. I want to thank the City Council. Um, again, we locked in at an interest rate that was in the twos, the municipal bonds. Again, uh, if you don't understand what that means, uh, it's, it's millions and millions of dollars saved over the term. So we went to, we went to uh, market, we borrowed $98 million. I also want to thank the City Solicitor, Megan Bridges, and her team because when they came to me and we decided that it was going to be on West, uh, West Elm Street and Warren Ave, uh, they said, Mayor, okay, what do you want from us? And I said, I want to work with friendly takings. I want to acquire 99 Warren Ave, which was a uh, kind of a problem building on Warren Ave across from Legion Parkway. Joe, you, you know it well from, from, from Harbor One down there. And then there was two other properties, uh, residential properties, and we literally had the lawyers reach out and they said, sure, we'll sell. So we acquired three properties, right? Friendly takings, not hostile, we're not going to court, we paid them what they, what they wanted. But now we have a full city block. We go from Highland Street to West Elm Street, city block, $98 million public safety. But it was, it's generational, but it's also long overdue. So what this is, it's four departments. It is the police, it is the fire, it is IT, our informational technology is based in the core building at Brockton High School. So they're going to leave Brockton High, going to free up five classroom spaces, which again is really, really helpful to the students and staff at Brockton High. And then BEMA, which is our Brockton Emergency Management Agency. So we're going to have four departments there. Now, um, we had um, Suffolk Construction bid on it. We had a, a committee that vetted that all out. I wasn't involved in it, but Suffolk Construction 
has promised me, Mr. John Fisher, the CEO, that we will be cutting the ribbon in summer of 25, so not too far away. Now with that, what else did we need to do? We need to make sure Warren Ave, which is one way, is going to be a two-way traffic now, right? And this is going to help Derek and his team at the Boys and Girls Club. It's going to help business that are on Legion Parkway. So we are going to go two-way traffic from Belmont Street, right at the parking lot that's owned by Plymouth County across from Spirit Court. Uh, and it's going to go up Warren Ave all the way to Spring Street. So past Vincente's, uh, past where the old McMenemy's lot is going up. It's going to be two-way traffic. We need that for the vehicle apparatus, and, and it's just the right thing to do. So we're having some transformation coming. Uh, I will tell you that every developer that calls me or comes to City Hall when I tell them about this, uh, this really piques their interest, that the city is stepping up financially, putting a lot of skin in the game for a purpose that's going to help long term. It's going to help the visitors that are going to need to go to that for the Ford Department. It's going to help the employees that dedicate themselves and the police and fire put their life on the line every day here and protect and serve. But it's also game changing because it's really going to revitalize that whole neighborhood. So uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, I also want to let you know, uh, Brockton Hospital, uh, Bob Hathie's the CEO, and I have to give a shout out, he's not here. Brian Nardelli is our fire chief, Brockton guy, Brockton high grad. Um, I was there a year ago, uh, we just marked the year anniversary. Brian called me, he said, hey, uh, hey Mayor, we have a little fire going on, and he was kind of minimizing that, and he said, you might want to come over. It wasn't a little fire, it was a ten alarm, largest in the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. What Brian and, and the, the brave men and women did that day, and also mutual aid in you know, a lot of different uh, towns and cities come here, was unbelievable. But it was also the brave uh, employees of Brockton Hospital Signature that were inside the building during an active massive fire. Now, some of you of a certain age know who Kurt Russell is, the actor, right? And he did a movie years ago called Backdraft. And I'm standing there, and I'm hearing, and I said to the chief, what the heck is that? He said, Bob. If the fire doors don't hold, that's the fire slamming against the doors. Everybody upstairs is going to perish. It's going to be backdraft. It's going to be a disaster, a tragedy. And so um, that was scary, but I will tell you, not one person was injured. Uh, the hospitals from all around, including Boston, Cape Cod, uh, were ready, willing, and able to step up, and they accepted even two women that were in active labor. Uh, but that was a, a day uh, that I will never forget. Uh, but there was uh, real uh, bravery outside and inside that building. Now it's been closed, so as a result of the closure for the year, yeah, thank you. As a result of the closure, uh, of course, the census numbers uh, are staggering at Good Sam, the stag and, and again, I want to thank Matt Heskin and his team at Good Sam, Sue Joss and Dr. Maria Celli, David Health Center, and uh, Alan Smith and his team over at South Shore and Wayman, they're just getting an influx of patients, right? It's, it's been nuts. It's been absolutely nuts. And so the waiting time in the ER, 12 hours, 18 hours, is just not optimal for providing health care. But I'm proud to say that each and every Monday, Bob Haffey and I have a conversation, either a Zoom or uh, a call, uh, even on holidays and on Mondays, and he updates me. Hey, Mayor, this is what's going on. We walked it last week. I took a tour, and Congressman Lynch will be coming, and all the elected officials will be invited to join in a couple weeks. But um, they will be opening this summer. Um, it's projected to be June, and that is going to help. And it's just so many fronts, so many, so many fronts. But I will tell you this: um, as the mayor, um, I came in six weeks before the pandemic, right? Lucky the Irish, I don't think so. But I will tell you this. What I decided to do immediately was to gather people and say, we're going to collaborate, we're going to work together. And if you don't want to collaborate and work together, there's the door, walk out. Because we're talking about saving people's lives during this pandemic. And so as a result of that, and everybody bought in, everybody bought in, it was awesome. Right? Competition didn't matter, it was about helping people, people business, people business. And as a result of that collaboration and relationship, because we're in a relationship business as well, um, when the fire happened, it was just seamless, we just kept going. Right? And we're just going to keep going on other endeavors that we're facing. So that's what the City of Champions means to me. It really does. Um, and I am excited to also say that Good Samaritan, we're all reading about stored health care and all the shenanigans going on there. Good, good Sam is in closing. I've been on many, many, many conversations and Zooms with the stored folks, with the state folks, with Matt Heskett and his team. So I want just to say right now, Good Samaritan Medical, it's in the black, it's not in the red, they're making money for the, for the system. I can't talk about the entire system, I only care about Brockton. It's based in Brockton, it's on the west side, it's, it's a regional hospital, it's a trauma center. We need one on the east side, we need one on the west side. We, of course we have the VA on Belmont Street. 
So the good news is I can say I've been told uh, undoubtedly it is not closing. So that's great news. Um, I want to thank the developers. We did a developers dialogue uh, a couple weeks ago. I, I try to do them as much as I can. Um, this morning, the morning that we did it, that morning, it was, it was snowy. Uh, and I showed up and Rob was there and Sydney was there and, and I said, you know, I don't think we're going to have too many people. The weather's kind of lousy. I said crappy, but I'll say lousy to clean it up to you all. <laughs> but I will tell you this, 80 people showed up. And it was developers that have invested and developed in the city of Brockton. Those that have done past projects like adjacent Korg or, or Trinity Financial. Those that are currently doing projects right now. And then those that were really looking into Brockton. So these are projects right now, and this is exciting because Impressa is, again, Jim Keefe and his team uh, at Trinity Financial. Uh, I mentioned Jason Corb. Uh, he and his, his company at Trinity Financial, they were the first ones to take a leap of faith in the downtown of the city of Brockton. When we adopted, when I say we, city, I was there 14 years, I still say we, we adopted uh, Chapter 40 out Smart Road Zoning. And it was a catalyst for development. And they ponied up 30 million bucks. I'm sure their investors said, you're nuts, you're going to lose money in Brockton, you're crazy. But they didn't. And that truly was the catalyst for investment. So we have Impressa. And then we have the Anglum, which, uh, which is Ted Carmen and, and Concord Square. And then Petronelli, where uh, Marvelous Marvin, Marvin Hagley used to train with the Petronelli brothers and Stevie Collins and Rock and Robbie Sims. Um, it has been transformed by, uh, by Ted Carmen and his team. Now, we use the proverbial tools in the toolbox, right? We use the ties, the TIFs, the HDIFs, the historic tax credits. Whatever we can give to developers that um, will help them develop in Brockton, I'm going to support. And the city council has supported everything I've brought before them on that. Because it's a collaboration of working with developers and making sure, number one, that we have high quality development. And just to piggyback on Dr. Mark, these aren't all market rate, there's affordable. They have to have at least 20% on a 40 hour smart growth zoning. So we are having affordable, we're having some market rate, but really what is driving people to come to the city of Brockton, and people who invest millions and millions and millions of dollars in Brockton, is transit oriented development, right? So we have the three commuter stops, Montello, Campello, downtown. The price might feel from, don't take this the wrong way, but Braintree, Quincy, Southie, Dorchester, Charlestown, it's too expensive, they're coming to Brockton. And I say come to Brockton, we welcome you with open arms. Nothing against Mayor Coogan down in Fall River or my friend Mayor Mitchell in New Bedford, but stay in Brockton. Get everything you need in Brockton. If you're a golfer, what the D-Dub. It's the best muni course in the, in, in the Carmel world. So I just also want to give a shout out to Rob Coley and Neighborhoods Housing Solution and Cindy. Uh, Lincoln School uh, on Newbury Street uh, and Highland Street, phenomenal game changer. That is 100% dedicated to senior citizen. Senior citizens only are going to live there. So thank you, Rob, and your team. Santa Street Station, Darren DeCoste and his team have invested, they've done a lot in the city of Brockton. This is another one across from uh, the train, across from uh, Soho Lofts near the, the current police station, soon to be former police station. And then one nine residents, Joseph Gonzalez, a uh, great story, uh, Brockton kid, graduate of Brockton High, and he understands how special this community is. And then you're looking at uh, Marion on Main, Marion Tuxedos will be uh, disappearing in, in short order. It's been generational. So if you have a tux, maybe bring it back, or maybe not. Maybe, maybe you don't have a tux, I don't know what to tell you. But um, Hotel Grayson uh, on Frederick Douglass, and then um, Brockton South, the old Lynch's towing uh, down in Camp Pello. Again, both of those projects are uh, our neighborhood housing solution. Um, Marvelous Mom at Hagler Park. Now, he just announced he's not running again, but stay rep Jerry Cassie, not just a friend, an unbelievable example of a public servant. We can give him a round of applause. Before they, they redistrict and change, and I want to thank um, Rep. Mendez, I know Rep. Dubois was coming, Senator Brady. Before they changed um, the redistricting, um, Jerry represented this, this portion. Um, and I had asked him um, when they you know, go to the, go to the uh, speaker and do the, the earmarks and the budgeting, if there was any way to get some, some state money um, for a, a monument, a fitting tribute to the champ. And he said, how much do you think you need? And I said, I don't know. And he went to bat for 75,000 for year one, 75,000 for year two, 150 grand. And so this spring um, on Petronelli Way, abutting a new road that was uh, accepted by 
the city council on Marvelous Marvin and Hagler Way, we're going to have an unbelievable statue. And I want to thank Cindy Merrill. She's been on the statue committee. Uh, an unbelievable fitting tribute. And all of you are going to be inviting that day. The Haglers are going to be here. We're going to try to get some boxing elites to come here as well. Maybe not Sugar Ray, because Mom and she didn't like Sugar Ray. He might not make it out of Brighton. He'll come in, but he might make it up. But, um, but I just want to tell you that this is a parklet, um, but it's going to be kind of like the North End for, for Joe DeMarco um, when you go in there and, and, and you see that. But, um, you know, this is something that we're excited about. Um, and it's going to be, again, another amenity in the downtown. So when we do walking tours and we educate and form the next generation, we're now going to be able to take them to, of course, the largest sports stash in the Northern Hemisphere up at Marciano Stadium with Rocky Marciano. And then we're going to go to the core of the city on the road that Marvelous Marvin used to train on. And we're going to see an unbelievable statue for Marvin Hagler. And then, thank you. New businesses, right? Open for business. I keep saying that. And uh, I've told the story before, but some of these really high net worth people, the guys that are guys and gals on Forbes magazine, I mean billionaires, when they look at Brockton, they look at things like do you have a Chick-fil-A and how many Starbucks do you have? Right? I, I never knew that, but they truly do, right? And so I can tell you right now we have a Starbucks at the Westgate, we have a Starbucks on Belmont, uh, not too far from, from Doug and his team at Stonehill. Um, but now we have a brand new one. It's, it's almost open across from Brockton High School on Belmont Street. So we have a Starbucks coming. We have a new hotel coming up to the Westgate. If you know where Shields MRI is at 265 Westgate, this is the lot that they acquired from the Shields family. It's a true, uh, that's the flag that they're going to be using by Hilton. And then Air Energy, I'm excited about this one. So Tim Murray, the former Lieutenant Governor, he heads up the chamber up in Worcester. When I became mayor, and I'm a friend, we're friends, and I called and I said, Tim, um, I'm looking for potential developers here in Brockton. And if you know anybody, I know you're in Worcester, but if you know anybody, send them my way. And he did. He's a man of his word. He said GFI from Worcester. They came down and they acquired some land on Industrial Boulevard uh, down in Wood 4. And, uh, and, they, and they built spec, an unbelievable warehouse. And then um, they were able to uh, attract air energy. And through the efforts of the city council, we provided them some, uh, some tie agreement on that. And they've relocated. So they've left the municipality and came to the city of Brockton, which is great, number one. It's a triple net. But they're also bringing employees in, right? And employees are going to go to the gas station. And they're going to go to the Starbucks or Dunks. I'm a dunk. <laughs> Who liked that dunk cake the other night? Did you see that? Huh? Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. That was great. Um, but I, I, I know we're probably, Dr. Mark and I can talk. He likes to walk. I just kind of like to talk. But um, I just want to let you know that there's new restaurants happening here as well, right? So we have Sunrise. If you haven't been there, I went to the soft opening. Um, I have high cholesterol, so I took two Lipitor when I walked in the door. The steak was phenomenal. So we have Sunrise on Center Street, uh, which is going to be great because when Brockton Hospital reopens, uh, we're going to have a lot of folks going there. It's like literally being in Newbury Street in Boston. It's awesome. Uh, we also have uh, Sallow Bar, uh, which is on North, North Montello Street. Uh, City Council uh, Dave Texera, uh, he's an entrepreneur and a business owner, and this is one of his ventures. Uh, if you're old like me, you know the BC, the Brockton Cafe. Uh, it is reopened. If you uh, want to go in and see an unbelievable uh, restaurant, please go there as well. There's just so many restaurants. At the end of the day, uh, I welcome more. You can never have too many, right? To have people live here is great, but you have to have the amenities that go with, with downtown living. Um, I also want to just uh, give a shout out. Uh, you don't have to be a baseball uh, fanatic like I am to appreciate this. Brian Kahn, uh, he owns the Brockton Rocks. He's one of those uh, billionaires uh, on Forbes. And I met him, I've met a couple billionaires this year. It's nice. It's not going to be rich, but it's okay. It's out in the city. But I want to tell you that. Um, he had asked me uh, would I support the idea of professional baseball coming to Brockton, and I said yes before he finished asking. And they realigned Major League Baseball, right? So MLB is a little bit different now. When we were growing up, it was the farm, right? And then it was minor league, and then the majors, right? Triple A, single A, uh, you know, Paw Sox, and New Britain for the Red Sox, and, and you know, it's changed now. So this is a frontier league. So this is a professional baseball team coming to the city of Brockton. Now, they originally did a contest, and the winning was uh, the New England Childerheads. Um, they asked if I liked that, and I, uh, my response was not favorable. So um, they've come out with an unbelievable, unbelievable new brand, the Knockouts. So the Knockouts are coming here. The Rocks aren't leaving. That was a condition that I said. 
because the Rocks are uh, collegiate uh, baseball players. Um, a lot of them uh, go to schools around here. And I want to give a shout out to Massillon Community College, uh, Bridgewater State, Stonehill, Curry. There's a big collaboration among those schools as well. So I just want to let you know that um, what's important about that, uh, ESPN will be coming here uh, to watch and to air these games. Uh, we're also going to have additional ability to employ people. Um, the problems they have right now is how they're going to find Rocktonians and those surrounding communities to work 80 games. So um, if you're looking for a summer job, Campanelli Stadium is going to be hopping this summer. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, 80 games is, is a lot. Um, and the fact is they're going to be able to manage that. So we're working together. Um, we also, um, you know how a couple slides ago, the COA, the Mary Cruz Kennedy, uh, we've also been fortunate because we had to relocate, and we relocated the COA to the Shaw Center. And the Shaw Center, as you know, it was Campanelli Stadium. And thanks to the efforts of the feds again, when I first became mayor, I was able to use the CARES Act funds, uh, federal money right at, the, right at the onset of COVID, $4 million to make sure that the Shaw Center was back up and running. And so the seniors are there now. It's a temporary relocation. Um, but it's great because if you've been to the Shaw Center, you actually get an unbelievable, unobstructed view of the field. So the seniors are going to see a lot of baseball this summer, which is an awesome endeavor. So I'm going to conclude with this. Um, we have issues. I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We have issues. Uh, we have a serious issue with the deficit on the school side, no doubt about that. Uh, we're having a lot of uptick in violence. Uh, we're having an uptick in uh, new homeless populations coming to Brockton. Uh, and I've said this, and if people don't like it, I'm sorry. I'm the mayor of everybody. I'm the mayor of the people that are fortunate enough to have a roof over their house, you know, over there and, and live in a house, and those that don't live on the streets. I'm their mayor. And so we need to come up with a compassionate, human approach to help all people, all Brocktonians, right? And we will do it. So my ask today to all of you is let's continue to collaborate. Let's continue to work together. The sky's the limit, right? We're only limited by our imagination. So let's continue to harness all of the intellectual capacity in this room and beyond these doors. Because honestly, when we talk about Brockton and we talk about the history of Brockton, and that's a nice segue into what I'm gonna do right when I conclude. The history of Brockton is special. We have to learn from the past to forge it into the future, right? But the future is to set the example now for the next generation. You know, my daughter Grace is 14, my son Tommy's 17, and then our youngest Will, he's only 11, right? And so it's, I'm, you know, people say, well, why do you want to be mayor of Brockton? You should not run again. And my view is this, quite honestly, is we have to continue the path that we're going on. We have to continue to understand what a special community this is and how we, collectively we, can bring it to the level that we all expect and we yearn for. And so with that being said, um, I was always told when I go to a party, this is a party, that you bring a gift. So I brought a gift today to uh, the Metro South Chamber of Commerce, and, uh, and then I'm going to present it to Chris. Um, it is Black History Month, and uh, as you know, uh, the Liberty Tree is on Frederick Douglass, the former high street city of Brockton. This year, um, when I became mayor, it, it dumbfounded me that the city of Brockton didn't own the tree. Actually, the tree sits on private property. So I, I tasked the uh, solicitor's office, we're gonna do another friendly taking. We have to own that. We have to own our own history. And so we were able to acquire the Liberty Tree. Um, and as you may know, the original Liberty Tree, Liberty tree um, got sick and diseased and was severed many, many years ago, decades ago, quite honestly. And I could never figure out where the, the trunk and a lot of the, the tree went. We, we just could never figure out where it went. I mean, it was a huge tree. And I took a tour with, I think, with Rob and, and Cindy and his team because they were kicking the tires to buy the Hotel Grayson. And wouldn't you know it was in the basement of the Hotel Grayson. Now how the heck it got into the basement, I mean, I, I, I don't know. But I know it's been found. And as a result of uh, Mother Nature, a new tree has sprouted from the original spot. We own that tree now. And this is important because not just for black history, and, and it's not Black History Month, 365 days a year. Uh, and I also want to recognize another elected official, Mr. Mr. Tony Branch, Bishop Tony Branch, who represents Southeastern Regional Location. <laughs> so, um, before I go into the presentation to Chris on behalf, um, tomorrow night, the Unknown School um, 
The name Lou Montgomery might not mean a lot to a lot of you. Um, I went to Brockton High, I played football at Brockton High, I went to Boston College. I wasn't good enough to play football at Boston College. But Lou Montgomery was the first African American football player at BC. And he was a BC, he was a Brockton High football player. Um, and there is a new documentary about Lou Montgomery. And so tomorrow night it is it is airing six to eight um, tomorrow night at the unknown elementary school, one three five Belmont Street. I've invited uh, all the newscasts in, the, in, in, in Boston to come. Uh, we've invited some um, people that are connected to Hollywood. Hopefully they come as well, because this is a story that needs to be told. And then as a BC, and I have two degrees from BC, they need to put a statue up at Chestnut Hill for honor Mr. Montgomery. So that's gonna be another mission we're gonna do. But I also just wanna let you know, Chris, if you could come up here. So, <clears throat> the Liberty Tree, thanks, Joe. Yeah. Located on nearby High Street, now Frederick Douglass Ave, Brockton's Liberty Tree marked an important stop on the Underground Railroad for those seeking to escape the evils of slavery. The majestic, majestic American sycamore dating back to the mid 1700s was an important, sturdy signpost of freedom in the years prior to the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation and the enactment of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. It was a gathering place for great voices advocating for the abolition of slavery and in later years for women's right to vote. The Liberty Tree was cut down in 2004 after being severely damaged by a storm. This piece, usually if my son was there, it'd be a drum roll. Anybody want to do a drum roll? Thank you, Cindy. This is an actual piece of the Liberty Tree. Oh, wow. This piece of the Liberty Tree is significant to that site as a reminder of our community's history. It serves as an enduring memento of Brockton's commitment to ensuring liberty and justice for all, presented by myself to the Metro South Chamber of Commerce on this 15th day of February in the year 2024. All right. <laughs> So again, I thank you for being here. I'm sorry, I know it's kind of run over. I want to thank Dr. Mark and, and the team. Um, but let's let's leave out on this note. We are truly better together. And as my Nana, who came here from Ireland to work in the shoe factories, and Hunt O'Sullivan used to say, Bobby, roll up the sleeves, get the job done. Move forward, keep going. And let's continue to do that. God bless you all. Much, Mayor Sullivan, and I'm sure it wasn't part of your plan to speak so long that we eliminated the rest of the program. So. <laughs> <laughs> Including, hopefully, we have your commitment to come back. Yes. For the grilling that we had for the question and answer period. There is one question that keeps coming up, uh, Mayor Sullivan, yes. on any planned use of the police station, the old police station. So um, we will be putting that out. Um, we've actually had already a lot of Boston developers call because it, it truly abuts the train track. Um, the kicking the tires right now is more of a commercial endeavor, they believe, kind of like Cambridge. Um, but that will uh, be going on the market uh, once we relocate into the new public safety building. Great. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank also uh, uh, today's ambassador open. team that's with us, Rich there's Morgan, some, some uh, Rich Morgan yeah. Photography, Rockton Community Access Channel, Enterprise News, Chamber of Staff Members, Pony Lee Club, our sponsors and partners, OCES, Old Colony Elder Services, and Catholic Charities. Um, we do this have, as we know, each good day Metro South randomly selects one company to be highlighted in our upcoming action report newsletter with our door prize, uh, as well as an American Express gift certificate. And the winner today is Sheila Sullivan, De John and uh, Woo! Miss Hyde. Sheila! Thank you all for your attendance and participation. You have a great rest of the day.